Okay, good morning. Good to have you with us this morning by way of the internet, and we hope that uh, we can give you a blessing today. It's really kind of difficult, isn't it, to stay home so much, and uh, you feel like uh, you have cabin fever, uh, you're all hemmed in, can't hardly go anywhere, and you're with your wife, and that just really creates a real problem sometimes, and uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I was, I'm sure a lot of you saw it online there where the fellow was asked whether it be A or B or whatever, and the guy said, A, would you rather be cooped up with your wife for two weeks in the house? And the fellow said, B. And he said that immediately. Did he know what B meant? <laughs> so I'm sure some of you are learning how to introduce yourselves in a different way which is a good thing. And I think a lot of people have done a lot of family things together uh, with their children. I know it's been hard on a lot of families, but uh, we trust that you'll make it through it. You know, I, I thought today I had uh, a message before all this happened about our verses on the wall. And uh, then uh, last week we just did one that tried to encourage the people because of the virus. And of course, I was going in that direction this week too. And uh, because I, I kind of get tired of hearing about it over and over and over. And uh, if you listen to the news, you're ready to commit suicide by supper time. And uh, so uh, I don't want to talk a whole lot about it. I'll just mention it. But uh, I think uh, the next couple of weeks going to be really, really difficult for our state. And uh, I hope that we can uh, be in quarantine. You could be able to, to shorten that curve and to bring it down some so that we don't have so many. So it's getting ready to hit really hard here, and we understand that, but our faith is in God, isn't it? And so uh, I had two other messages I actually worked on, going through trials, and then I was even going to preach on Job. But uh, I just uh, took out an old message that I like and just tried to remind us of the goodness of God, what we have already have. And uh, I think that that should encourage us anyway. Because, you know, with this virus, we see its dangers. Uh, we see the mortality of it. It can really get, get something. Somebody was just saying before, earlier on, that uh, at this uh, ball game, uh, this one lady was behind several people, and she was coughing that night. And several people came down with uh, uh, COVID-19. And, uh, but uh, the lady actually has passed away. So it's a very dangerous, aggressive, uh, quickly caught uh, disease, virus. And so uh, you have to be careful. You have to stay clean and wash your hands a lot and do a lot of things. And so uh, just be wise in your decisions that you make. I think it's a good thing that we've kind of shut down a little bit in order to try to prevent this from spreading more than it has. I remember some time ago, I, uh, I was in my house in the parsonage at Emmanuel, and it was late Saturday evening, and I asked myself this question, how did I get to where I was at that moment in my life? Uh, what was the process that brought me to where I was at the moment? And so I wrote some things down and hope that they'll be a blessing to you. And I'd like for us to look back over our life just a little bit. Solomon did that. He, stay, he says this in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things, and that meant the sinful things with him too, that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. At the end of Solomon's life, he said, I tried it all. I went beyond what man could actually do because my wealth permitted me to do that and my authority. And after it's all said and done, all is vanity. And then I thought about that. I said, well, is that true of the child of God? And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, 
after we put our faith in the gospel, and he says, and such were some of you, you were sinners, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so something wonderful has happened to us that are saved. There was a day in our life when we heard the gospel, how Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And that day, faith came to our hearts, and we believed in that gospel was enough to save us. And upon doing that, by believing, we became new creatures in Christ. And we're different now. As a child of God, we say 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of the love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew, not, it knew him not. So as a child of God, we look at life differently, completely different from what Solomon was saying. Let's look back and see some things. First of all, we've been eternally chosen. We've been eternally chosen. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That word elect means chosen through the sanctification of the Spirit and the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. In that verse, you have the complete Godhead that was actively involved in God choosing us. Ephesians 1, 4 says this here according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Now think about that. Before the foundation of the world, God purposed us. Uh, there's a saying that God, he doesn't just act on spur of the moment. He purposes, plans something out, then he start, goes back, and he begins. And God chose us, now he's stepped back, and he begun until one day we believed in him. Something else, we've been supernaturally prepared. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. In other words, the reason we came to faith was the Spirit of God set us apart, softened our hearts, helped us to be receptive so that we would exhibit faith in the gospel. As I look back, I remember the last week before I was saved, and I looked at several instances how God was working in my life to bring me to that point of that Sunday when I believed in Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for that. So we've been supernaturally prepared. Also, we've been undeservingly called. Before we were saved, we had no desire. We were foolishly lost. We were dead in our sins, and it would have been fair to send us to hell but God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 says, There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. He calls us, so we call upon him. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know why he called me. I don't know why he called you. Sometimes I even think, why me? But I'm so grateful he did. We've been undeservingly called. We've been graciously forgiven. Colossians 1.14 says this here, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And uh, the uh, preceding verse says, he's forgiven us all our sins. On the cross, Christ took your sin and mine, all of our sins, our past sin, our present sin, our future sin. And he took the penalty and the punishment of all of our sins that we would ever commit. He took them up on himself on the cross. There's a saying, much forgiven, much required. But there's not too many people who turn back and thank God for that forgiveness. I think of the ten lepers. The ten lepers, they were healed by Christ and only one returned back 
to say thank you. And I think that's like, I think we forget sometimes how great forgiveness we really got when God saved us. All sins been forgiven. Then we've been permanently accepted. Ephesians 1, 6 says this here, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The reason the father accepts me, I'm in his son. And that word accepted means highly favored, always. Now in our life, often we are rejected. We're abused by the world and even other believers, but we're never rejected by God. We're always highly favored. Then also, we're, we've been bodily indwelt. Something has taken over inside of us in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, faith come by hearing, the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment you were saved, God came to take up residence inside of you. Colossians 1.27 says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says this, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? You see, the reason we can change, the reason we can live the right way according to the word of God is because God himself now lives inside of us. Now, Mary had a miracle happen for nine months. He called his name Emmanuel being interpreted as God with us. But think about this, with us, God is sealed inside of us permanently until we go to heaven. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that's us. And then we've been family adopted, family adopted. Ephesians 1.5 says, having predestinated us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. It was his will. He wanted us to be part of his family. He says in Galatians 4, 5, and 6, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. A lot of people say, well, we're all the children of God. No, we're not. John 8, 44, the Lord said uh, to uh, the religious Pharisees and so on, ye are of your father the devil. You don't become a child of God until you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people have heard my testimony, but my father was never around for me for my life. But when I got saved... I became part of the family, the whole family of God. Now I have a heavenly father. Not only that, we've been positionally justified. Now we have a right standing, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. To be justified means before the heavenly court, we've been legally declared righteous. God has ruled in our favor once for all. Our case, our case, we've been acquitted, forgiven, pardoned, cleared of every charge, and our case can never, ever be reopened. It's a shut case now with him. Why? God hath made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then we've been eternally secured. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Spirit of God himself is the seal. For anybody to try to get us out of Christ would have to get through the Holy Spirit, and that's an impossibility. Not only that, Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We have been redeemed. We've been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. I love the meaning of the word redeem. It means 
as a slave, and we were slaves to sin. We have been set free. We were purchased with a price, Christ, his finished work. He has set us free so as never to return. That's security, amen? First Corinthians, or First John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe upon the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Before the world was even created, he says, Jim Devaney will be saved. That settled it. Amen. Also, we've been scripturally guided. See, God has a purpose for each one of our lives. He has a plan. And that purpose and plan is found within the word of God. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you become a Christian, you're saved, it's at that moment, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. God's got a purpose and a plan for us. And even though we think we might have led our own life, as the old hymn says, that you look back over your life, Jesus led me all the way. And that's the way that it works. Then also we've been personally known. That separates Christianity from religion. You see, Ours is not a religion, it's a relationship. Our God is not far away, far off. He's right here in us. He knows us. We know him. We walk with him. We talk with him. We live together. Now, in our relationship with other people, most of the time to be friends, it's conditional, but not with God. God says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee also we've been now think of all these things that's already done for us we've been illuminated in our past the God of this world had blinded our minds and our eyes to the truth before we were saved we were natural and the natural man receiveth not the things of God because they're foolishness to, to, to them they can't grasp spiritual truth whatsoever but when you put your faith in the gospel, it's at that moment that God makes us alive and he gives us a spiritual antenna that now we sense God speaking to us through his word and it comes alive to us. Amen? 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12 says this here. For what a man knoweth the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. I gave the illustration one time how the young girl, she had read a book and it didn't click with her at all didn't make a whole lot of sense. Then one day, she met its author and, uh, at school, and they went out on a date. When she got home, she went back and she picked the book up he had written, and she read it, and she said it was like the message of the pages leaped off those pages into her thing. What made the difference? Now she knew the author. And the reason for us is the reason this book here means so much to us because when we're saved, now we know the author. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and we know him now, amen? And then we've been church challenged. Church challenged uh, to love the church. And the reason is Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ loved the church so much he died for the church. Now, I know when he says he died for the church, he means the body of Christ. I understand that. However, most of the time when it uses the word church in the Bible, it, it's always to the local church. Not always, but most of the time. 
God loves not only the body of Christ, but he loves the local church. That's why he plants pastors and deacons and leaders and so on. Because it's at church where your faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's where we worship, where we give him his due. He deserves it. It's where we serve him. It's where we meet people. You know, uh, the church, uh, Paul says up on the first day of the week in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, he says, flee with them that call on God out of a pure heart. There's something special, and that's why this virus thing, making us not meet, is kind of difficult because it's not good that we be alone. God wants us. We need people. <laughs> and, and so church fulfills that, and we put all that together. We should love our church. Then we've been graciously gifted. God wants everybody he saves to be involved doing something for him. Every one of us have at least one gift. It states in 1 Peter 4.10, he says this here, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. All of us have at least one gift. I remember... Uh, when I was first saved and I went to University Heights uh, Baptist at that time and uh, I was sitting on the pew and I said boy this is kind of boring just come, let's preach her go home and anyway somebody asked me to go out on visitation I went out on visitation and they asked me to start teaching a junior boys class and I started that and I began to win some of them to Christ and Carol and I began to teach the junior high boys and girls. And then later on in our life, we began to teach the teens. And then over in Ohio, we taught young married couples class. And, and everything just on and on until finally I became a pastor. I, I've been through all the, the circumstances there in the church. And I'm thankful for the gifts that God gives individual people to be able to do these things. Amen? I really am. Then we've been socially, spiritually different. You see, when you get saved, your life changes. Your life's not the same. All of a sudden, you begin to look out for new friends, new ways to walk in faith together. The Bible says we are to do good unto all men, but especially unto those of the household of faith. And God says, listen, uh, you're different now. And I've said this many times. Who you run with will determine the spiritual level you can obtain. If you just run with low life, your obtainness will be low. <laughs> That's why you need to seek out somebody who's a lot more spiritual than you and try to hook on to them and hang with them for a while. I remember when I first went to Tennessee Temple, uh, I've, I've said before that I didn't know what an adverb was. And I had to take six semesters of English, think that through. And I'm still learning. Carol still corrects me. <laughs> and I, I think about those days of that just taking place, but uh, I hadn't been to school for 13 years. I went and got my GED right before I went down to Tennessee Temple. And while I was there, God brought... Charlie Chapman and Ron Whitlock into our lives, mainly Charlie and Faye, and uh, they were jet air airplane mechanics, and they were smart and brilliant and all that. So I hooked up to them, and they lifted me up as I went through Tennessee Temple. And who you run with determines the outcome of your life. Not only that, we've been faithfully provided 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says this here. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. I've been saved now 50 plus years and God's never let us down. One way or another, God has provided for us. Sometimes lean, sometimes plenty. 
but God's been faithful through it all. He's given us beyond what we ever asked for or ever, or ever even thought of. Now, in my position as pastor, it's a little bit more difficult because you, you're a pastor full-time and those things, and so you can't go out and get other jobs and on the side and so on and so on, and it makes it very difficult. And throughout my whole life, though, God has put individual people all through these 50-plus years who have helped me and Carol through this walk. And God's been faithful. And we've been faithfully provided for, have we not? Now, fellas, I'm going to skip the next three and jump down to number 20. To number 20. I had 25 points to give you. I'm on number 20 right now. Okay, we've been spiritually empowered. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's why Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do. You know what? That's exactly what I do. And there's that daily battle each day of dying the self and allowing Christ to live his life through us. I've said often that the greatest enemy we have is ourself, is our own flesh, and you have to guard it. Then not only that, notice Philippians 2.13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will to do of his good pleasure. God's not left us alone. If you've ever noticed that when you're in a struggle and you lean up on God, there is a surge of God inside of us that helps us to win that battle. And then also we've been abundantly rewarded. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Amen? 1 Corinthians 3.14 says this here, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Hebrews 6.10 says this, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. I promise you this, what you do for Christ will last forever. It's an, an interesting thing. Most people want to be conformed by this world and its culture. But all that's in the world is evil because it's controlled by Satan and his demonic evil system. And John says all these things of the world will pass away. That's why Paul says, don't be conformed to this world. Set your affection on things that are above so that the world doesn't control you. Then we've been sovereignly conforming. What do I mean by that? Nothing is by accident or by chance. All the tests, the trials, the valleys, the sufferings, the tribulations, the virus, all have a purpose. 2 Corinthians 4.10 says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Through everything we go through, he wants us to be conformed to Jesus. Galatians 4.19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. You see, God's the potter, we're the clay. And God's molding us. Sometimes he'll get a pebble in there and he has to pull it out. It hurts. But God's smoothing it out. He's got a purpose. So as we look back, we've been also lovingly entrusted. 2 Corinthians 5.18 And all things are of God which hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us 
the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, with this gospel message that we have that's for today, God's depending on us. Christ, when he's on earth, he set the example. Christ, he found sinners. He sought them out. He found sinners. And then Christ, he was a friend of sinners. A lot of people criticized him for hanging with lost people sometimes. But he had a purpose because Christ was a forgiver of sinners. That was his whole drive, his whole purpose. Now, you and I are ambassadors for Christ. Now, think about this. Ephesians 3, 8, 9. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Do you understand that when you rightly divide the scriptures and you know dispensationally that God temporarily has set Israel aside and now he's calling forth the body of Christ to be filled, one day he'll deal with Israel again. But right now it's the body of Christ. Do you understand that God put Israel and the 12 on hold just for us today? And he's depending on us to get this mystery gospel of grace message out there. Number 24, we've been unfathomably, yeah, unfathomably loved. What can separate us from the love of Christ? And he gives that long list, even death. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, if he loved us while we were sinners, don't you think he loves us while we're one of his children? Romans 5, 5 tells us that the last part of that verse The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I have a plaque up in my office I've mentioned before. It's on the wall there and it has love and it gives the definition of love. And the definition is he stretched out his arms and died. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. It compels us. It motivates us. It moves us to where we come to a point, as Psalm 116, verse 1 says, I love the Lord. Why? Because he first loved me. And lastly, you said amen. I heard you. Number 25. We've been heavenly awaited. Philippians 1, 23 says this here. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And boy, there's a, the older you get, the more people you love and know are there, and you begin to get a little anxious. Boy, I'd like to see them one day here. I'd rather depart and be with Christ And all of that, by the way, Titus 2.13 says this, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope we, we do go up soon by way of rapture, no doubt about it. But we know in heaven there's the Old Testament, the New Testament saints. I want to find Zacchaeus because he's a little short guy. I want to feel big. (laughs) He's just a little man the Bible talks about, amen? The angelic host is there. Our loved ones are there. Now think about this. This Christ that we love, we serve, we read about, we long for face to face one day. I love the song I can only imagine, huh? So I wrap all this up by saying this. We who have been saved, we look back over the past Do we come out and say, all is vanity, all is vexation of spirit? No way. We say, glory to God. Because of everything that he has done for us. Romans 8, 31 says this here. 
what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He's the one who's done all this for us. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you understand what we have just being a Christian? All these things we've been, these things are part of our life, our makeup now. Why in the world would we go around and say, woe is me? Why would we go around and say, God is dead? You see, a lot of people, they think they have faith, but when the trials come, they say, oh, God. Get up and trust God. Amen. Even when there's a virus going on, our faith has to be there. And I can't imagine what our future is going to be. Ephesians 2, 5 through 7, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Not only has he been doing so much for us here, he's got a purpose and a plan for us when we get there. And it's according to his riches and his grace. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this here, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We think he's something here, We can't comprehend what it's going to be like there, amen? And I say to you this morning, because of these things we have, if God never ever did another good thing for us, he's already gone beyond our expectations in the first place. We don't need one more blessing from God to prove God or to say the say that makes him good. He's been more than generous with us in what we have already. Do you even stop and think the privilege that we've had to have been born in this country with freedom and liberty to worship the true God? You look around the world and you see what's going on. You know what's going on now because of the internet. And you see all the difficulties they're going through. And here we are. We get a little inconvenienced. And we come apart over here. What if you were in the line as refugees over there? What if you didn't have the medical care over there and they don't have like we have here? Do you understand the blessings that we have received from Almighty God? God's been good to us. He is good to us. He's a gracious God. And we need to be looking to him and thanking for all that he has done for us. And if he never did anything else, I still want to say, God, I still love you. I still praise you. I think of Job, and I close with this. I think of Job, lost his family, lost his wealth, his workers, his businesses. He's been sitting down under boils all over his body. Physically, it's torment. And Job says this in Job 10, verse 12. He says to God, Thou hast granted me life, and favor. Now this, he's sitting there in boils. And favor and thy visitation, the way you appear in my life, hath preserved my spirit. Did you see, he wasn't there shaking his face, his fist in God's face. He wasn't there complaining. Even in the midst of his torment and everything going on, his world turned upside down. He said, God, you've been favor, favorable to me. You've given me life. You've given me blessings. You've even been real to me at times in my life to where you've revived my spirit. 
And I say to us as believers today, we've been highly favored by God. You know, you listen to the world, no hope. But if you listen to God, you'll realize what you really have in Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We're thankful for the truth that you've done so much for us already. And God, we pray that it would be your will that it, this virus would not last real long. But Lord, whatever your will is, you have a purpose, you have a plan. And through it all, we know we have you. As Paul said, rather by life or by death, we're going to praise God. And Lord, we're going to praise you regardless of what happens here. We love you. Thank you for all you've done for us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.